Okay, well, Kim Thanks. asked me, I told us and Genevieve, and I think Lisa was hearing too, that if we could go over um, ALS, because we have a client that now was just diagnosed with ALS, and then maybe yeah. a little bit of MS too. So I thought that we would talk about that. I think that's a great topic. Um, and I, did, I didn't have much time because I just got the email today, but I... Um, did did put to get throw together a few little images that I can share with you. So I'll just I'll share a screen. I wanted I wanted to explain a little bit what they are. And keep in mind that I haven't worked in neurology for many years, but um, as far as the movements go, I can really give you some insight. But I think it's good to sort of see what what it is that we're talking about that's happening, so you have an idea why maybe one day it presents one way and one day it presents the other way and different way or what the progression is or what you can expect to see. So I'm gonna share my screen and if you'll just bear with me for a minute. So here, what I'm trying to show you is a neuron, a motor neuron. And what, what are we talking about here? So what, what you're looking at is you're looking at this motor neuron, which is a nerve uh, that talks to the muscle. And these little fingerlets are what, how the nerve communicates with the muscle. It's called the neuromuscular junction. And as you can see, this nerve is hitting several different, we call this fasciculus of the muscle fiber, right? So in both cases, uh, if we're talking about ALS, if you guys don't know ALS, it's um, Lou Gehrig's disease, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It's amorphic lateral sclerosis is what it's called. And it basically eats away the myelin sheath around the nerve, which is this, what you're looking at here and here and here, which is basically a protector or cover of the nerve that actually helps nerve conduction or um, the electricity, so to speak, of the nerve to give the information down the chain all the way to the muscle. So in both ALS and MS, this is getting worn down and um, destroyed. So I'll show you what that looks like. All right, so here's that nerve again, the nerve cell, that's its nucleus. And here's the myelin sheath is yellow and the nerve fiber and the little dendrites that go to the muscle to make that neuromuscular junction. So typically the electric wave is going from this to this to this sort of jumping down the nerve so that when it gets to the muscle where it doesn't have the myelin, it's giving good information to the muscle and then the muscle contracts, right? It does what your brain, this nerve is ultimately being told what to do from your brain, uh, tells it what to do, passes down and your muscle does what it needs to do. In, this is showing MS and damaged um, myelin or demyelination, we call it. So now that you can see, you're not gonna be able to jump so easily from one part of the nerve to the other in order to get the message to the muscle. So the messages don't get through very clearly or very well. And so when it gets to the muscle, the muscle is getting some information, but not all information. And that can lead to problems with coordination, uh, problems with contracting the muscle. Like they could think I want to contract that muscle and really try and it just doesn't happen or it doesn't happen the way they think it's gonna happen because these myelin sheaths are being eaten away. Okay, so then um, let's look at this one. So here, oops, sorry. Okay, this is, I know it looks really overwhelming, but I, what I wanted to do here is show you all the nerves kind of running down. And this one's not as clear. I'll show you a clearer one in a minute. Okay, here we go. So this is showing you nerves um, coming down. And what you want to realize is the nerves are coming down from inside your brain. Right, so if we trace, let's see what this happens. Okay, that's much more simple. It's hard to see because we're not looking in the spinal cord. I'm gonna turn this guy around here, or girl. And you can see, if you look closely, 
you can see that you're getting the nerve cord, the spinal cord here in between the vertebra. And you can see the nerves exiting, right, at all different levels. So these are our peripheral nerves exiting. I'm gonna slide up here, right? It's happening all the way down the spine, right? Here you can see that the spinal cord is going all the way up into the brain. And so the messages of these nerves are coming right from your brain, right? So in ALS, we're having some issues all the way up from the brain already. In MS, they're not really sure why the myelin is breaking down. In ALS, uh, they have a better idea of where it's coming from. Um, and it's coming because, and they're finding this extra protein in the brain. I have to look and do a lot more reading and see exactly, but if they don't know who's gonna get it or why they're gonna get it, but it starts to destroy that pathway from the brain down all the way down into those peripheral nerves. And so you can see these, if we're talking about nerves into the arm from the neck here, right? If that nerve is not giving information that it needs to get to the muscles in order to bend the elbow, they're gonna have a really hard time bending the elbow. And so there's not a lot that we can do. Um, let's see, I'll put on more layers. So you can just see, right? This is all the nerves in the body come right from that place. There's no other way that we get messages to the body, but through that pathway. Um, okay. And then I think that was it. Let me just check. There was one other. Okay, this one. So these are, there's probably more information than you need. Oops, but um, right here, we have the ascending and descending pathways in the spinal cord. And I just, I just think it's nice to make this link from the brain into the spinal cord. There's a lot of information, but um, I just thought it would be nice to see. There are different tracks that come from different parts of the brain. We have, um, and it doesn't matter for now, it's coming basically from the cortex of the brain coming down in through into the spinal cord, traveling through some of them cross over and some of them stay on the same side. So sometimes it's right side of brain controlling right side. Sometimes it's usually right side of brain controlling left side of brain. And it's a little different for sensory than it is for motor. So there's a motor neuron and a sensory neuron. With ALS, it's typically the motor neuron that's being affected. Motor neurons will control all your motor function. So it's a progressive disease where things break down with in, information breaks down, there's information breakdown to the motor part. So the brain usually stays pretty well intact throughout the disease. The, whereas MS, you can also have sensory breakdown. Um, and now the other thing to know is that there's, um, with both case, in both cases, you can have, um, here we go, here's our little neuroscience. I was going to show you this two minute video in a minute if you want to see it. But with both um, cases, what was I going to say, you can have um, relapsing and remitting. So meaning, Sometimes they're doing fine and sometimes they're doing worse and then they'll do worse and sometimes do a little bit better. This is more common with MS than with ALS, but can also happen a little bit with ALS. So if you see somebody, if you're seeing somebody with MS or ALS, they might be better the next week just because somehow they're getting more messages down the chain than the week before. So let me play, do you guys want to see this two minute video? Yes. Yes, <laughs> for me. Yep. Okay. All right, here it goes. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Also known as Lou Gehrig's disease in the U.S. and motor neuron disease in the U.K., ALS is characterized both by muscle spasticity and a progressive weakening of the muscles. As the disease progresses, patients may lose hand and arm function 
and experience difficulty walking, speaking, and even breathing. Respiratory failure is often the cause of death, and the average survival time from diagnosis is around three to five years. Although some cases of ALS are inherited, in the vast majority of cases the cause of ALS is unknown. ALS is a neurodegenerative disorder, meaning it is characterized by the degeneration and death of neurons. Specifically, the affected neurons in ALS are called upper and lower motor neurons. Upper motor neurons extend from the cerebral cortex or brainstem and carry motor information down to the spinal cord. Lower motor neurons extend from the spinal cord or brainstem to skeletal muscle to cause movement. Degeneration of upper motor neurons often is responsible for spasticity and modest weakness, but degeneration of lower motor neurons causes more disabling weakness. As the motor neurons stop working, muscles also begin to atrophy. Mutations in several genes have been linked to the development of ALS, but the effects of the, the mutations are not completely clear, and the mechanism that causes neurodegeneration in ALS is still not understood. Similar to other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, ALS is characterized by the accumulation of dysfunctional proteins within neurons. Although the impact of these protein groups or aggregates is unclear, it is hypothesized that they could impair neuronal function. There also are a number of other mechanisms proposed to play a role in neurodegeneration in ALS, and it is likely more than one is involved. So that just gives you a little idea we could look at more detail, but I think that's enough to really understand, to have enough understanding as to what's going on. Um, okay, and then I had that one that I wanted to show you really quick of this, uh, wait, wait, this one. Okay, so this also seems very overwhelming, but this is just to show you that muscle fiber and the skeletal muscle this is a skeletal muscle. So these, what you're looking at are the different contractile, the Z lines and the contractile in between. So when a nerve gets to these, it tells each unit to, to contract the chemical reaction that happens. And then the nerve, uh, then the nerve allows the muscle to contract. So you can see that if, if a nerve is partially damaged, some information might get to one bundle or two bundles and just not to all the bundles. So there are more than one nerve and more than one nerve arm that can potentially get to a specific muscle. And so that's the point I wanted to make here is that with more than one arm getting to a specific muscle, you may be able to help somebody stay stronger for longer because if you, can, if you have other pathways, a lot of times our bodies will find other pathways to help a muscle contract. So if we can find other nerves that will help the muscle contract, the muscle will stay active a little bit longer, even if one of the motor neurons or one of the nerves is damaged. So um, the other thing, the other difference between ALS and MS, MS is uh, an autoimmune disease, right? Whereas ALS is not, it's just a degenerative cortical and neural, neuron, neuronal disease. And the MS, people actually can live for quite, quite a long time with MS. With ALS, it's usually, some people last longer than five years, but it's usually not more. It's only like 10% get past five years. So, um, so that is the sad part because we now have one of our clients diagnosed with it, who we all care very much about. But, um, but here's what I wanted to also share is that in, I was, researching as I was putting this together quickly, um, I was also looking about um, the physical therapy websites to see how helpful movement work and therapy work can be for somebody with MS or ALS. More specifically, I was looking at the ALS piece of that. And um, they were saying that they definitely need to be working on strengthening and mobility um, with ALS. So that made me feel good about, okay, there is something we can do to be helpful. And the reason that I was explaining about that nerve and showing you that different nerve arms can go to different parts of the muscle is that uh, you can still ask for action, even though it's hard for a client or that person to get the reaction that they want. So you can, the more we challenge the system, the longer that they'll have a chance to keep strong, right? And the longer they stay strong, the better the quality of life, however long that might be. 
So in, um, I wanted to give you some ideas of things you can do and not so much ideas in the short, in this current time frame because it's easiest now, right? If, if somebody is recently diagnosed, they're still usually pretty functional at this point. So you have two goals, which are just the goals that you know what to work with. One is strength and one is uh, range of motion, maintenance of range of motion. Now, you might find that sometimes they get a little spasmic or it's hard to contract or they get stuck in a little bit of a contracture type of motion. But for the most part, they should be able to move through it. He should, he should be able to move through it at this phase. So keeping moving, going into your strength, loading exercises, asking for movement, and then coordinating movement with thought, right? Keeping the brain working towards that movement is really key. So thoughtful motion, which is exactly what Pilates is. So that's what's great about that. So anything you're doing, just keep that mental process going. Try and, add, and if something isn't working well, try and support it somehow. Now in early stages, like you could do footwork, you can do all the other things, but say for example, uh, it's a day either with MS or ALS where the right leg is not working as well as it should. It's not as coordinated. One of the best things you could do is get them on footwork and have them put both feet there and make both feet do the work and make that right leg do the work with the left leg so that the left leg's helping it and the motion's happening and they're thinking about moving that right leg, right? So you're asking for recruitment to those muscles and you're creating the motion. Even if they're using the left leg more than the right leg, that's okay. We're creating that motion and we're asking for that right leg to do the work, which is gonna stimulate something happening in that right leg, right? So you're not looking anymore for exact alignment and exact perfect everything being perfect one side to the other. What we're looking for is seeing, finding the places that are troublesome and getting function out of those places. So that a lot of times would be helping them get that function. So say for example, yeah, go ahead, Kim. Well, <clears throat> the other day um, he told me that um, he wasn't supposed to build strength that build, he wasn't supposed to go to building muscle and um, he mostly wanted to stretch. And so I wasn't quite sure what to do with that. Um, and I, I, I wondered if, you know, he's starting to do some research, research himself, which you would. And if he said something about if he's tearing the muscle like you do with weight training, um, that oh, it, yeah. it's not gonna repair. So I think it's important for me or us to understand, yeah, we're building strength with footwork and I actually had to reduce the springs for him um, from the, the classics, um, but we're not building the muscle the same way that you do when you tear the fibers with like weight training. Is that? Yeah, so here's the other thing though, with Pilates standard spring settings, Right now, I mean, I don't think you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you should be that much weaker just yet. Right. So assess well, where he, go ahead. I think, I think it's been a few months and I, I don't think he's done a lot in the lower, with his lower torso. So it was too heavy. And um, then his legs were shaking when we were trying to do supine series. So I just had him keep his feet on the bar and move his arms around. Yeah. So I think um, you don't want to go to failure, right? But Pilates generally doesn't anyway. Mm -hmm. So don't, I would say don't be afraid of working the muscles. We, need, we want the muscles to work. And, and I can mm -hmm. have a conversation with him around that too, if that's helpful. But, Maybe. Um, yeah. yeah, it might be helpful. We're not going to muscle failure. That's when the fibers start to tear. Right. We're okay. going in a comfortable zone, but you do want some load because you want to demand from those muscles. You have to demand from those muscles. Otherwise, they're going to get weaker because there's no demand on them. Right? And okay. the weaker they are at the beginning of this pro pro progression, the faster they will atrophy. So we want the most muscle strength that we can get at any given time. 
but okay. right, we don't want to break down the muscles. So he should not feel sore the next day or the 48 okay. hours after. He shouldn't feel sore from the workout, right? Okay. Two days later, but he should feel like he's doing something while he's here okay. and it shouldn't just be stretching. Um, yeah. The, so there, there's that strength piece and we can have a conversation about whether or not I chat with him or if you want to chat with him. Yeah, well, let's just see how it goes in the next couple of bit, week or so. Yeah. So, um, you, but you do want to stretch also because you want to keep length. So you don't want to let them get into these contractures. That's the other part of it. So um, you want to do some work through full range of motion of the mm -hmm. body muscles and that can be slow and intentional. And again, if one side is able to do it and the other side's not doing it, put them in a place where they both help each other. Hold a bar, they both go. The, the Cadillac, right? Think, mm -hmm. So I have to say the Cadillac now as things progress is gonna become the best friend here because you can put them on the Cadillac, you can um, get the legs in the trapeze moving, you can get the legs in the springs moving. I've even moved springs from the leg springs and hung them from the trapeze overhead to create different lines of work and different lines of movement. So you can get really creative. Hey Lisa, would you mind muting your um, microphone? There's some, like, thank you. Um, you can get a lot of movement um, from having those springs as assist or having the bar as assist. So all the, all the, the tools we have are right there on that Cadillac. Um, and I would encourage as long as you possibly can to keep working on weight bearing. So standing work is key. Doing as much as you can in a standing position is a great idea and great key as long as you can, because we want to challenge those legs. Yeah, we so, did a lot of just standing, like standing four way hip, but without the, the strap. Cause I think I was thinking balance. I mean, he needs to needs to be able to balance. So, yeah. and, you know, working yeah. on glute knees, so. Yeah, so all, all of the same things you would work on. And it just gets, you have to have a creative mind. So as things get harder for him functionally, you wanna be creative about how you get that motion. And don't be afraid to use the legs, the straps on the reformer, the straps on the Cadillac. The straps on the reformer are actually gonna be, help. The, for one time, the pulley system on the reformer is better than not having a pulley system because you can create motion on one side with the other side, right? So for okay. once we actually want that uh, pulley system helping us, you know? And don't worry so much about is it even side to side or right now we just wanna make sure that every joint and every muscle can go through its range of motion with as much force, you know, as we can get out of it uh, and functional force. So you, you, the description to him would be, I understand we don't want to hypertrophy your muscles and try and build them up to big muscles, but we want to use them so that you can carry your weight functionally for as long as we can. And so the re footwork and all of that, everything we do is actually just functional. It's moving your own body weight. So we're never going to load more on than just your body weight. So it's different than just going and lifting weights in the gym okay. in that way. So, so that's where, and, and I think it could be, we can have an ongoing conversation. We can come back and talk about this again um, when things are progressing and you need more ideas about things to do. Um, I had a client with MS come in, even when he was in the wheelchair, um, the times where he was really in the wheelchair and we would get on the Cadillac and was, he was so surprised at how much he could do um, with the Cadillac, with the legs and the springs, with it was, it was great and it was fulfilling and he was so relieved that he could actually do a lot with that assist. So, so um, yeah. I have a question about MS. I had somebody come in ages ago, a couple of years ago that had MS. And also what I remembered from the PMA book was something about body temperature. If a person has MS, that they shouldn't get overheated. 
Yeah. So the temperature control can be affected as well. So you want to make sure that they just stay comfortable. I don't think we have that problem in the studio with being too hot. So all right now. Maybe, <laughs> not yeah. now. Maybe in the summer, just make sure it's temperate and giving grace. I don't think that's the same for ALS because okay. ALS isn't sensory, it's motor. So MS is more sensory. Um, and I think affects more of uh, the body that ALS is really generally really just the myelin and the neurons, the neurons failing and the myelin sheaths getting um, falling apart and then not being able to move. So uh, having um, motor function is what happens. And that's actually what happens in the end is they don't have the motor function to move their diaphragm and that's why they can't breathe and need breathing assist. So, yeah, and so that's why, and, and sometimes before that it affects the ability to swallow because that's a voluntary muscular, muscular contraction as well. So sometimes they're having to have a tube to eat enough to get enough calories in because they can't swallow well enough without choking or aspirating. So, it's not a it's not a fun road to be on. So as, as much as you can do to keep them moving and keep them functional, you know, is is fantastic. It, it'd be nice if the person could just stay as functional as possible until until it gets that bad that that it's affecting the respiratory system, and and that would be the best quality of life, right? So, yeah, I know. <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> What's ironic is one of my really good friends, um, the day after I got your email, Kim sent me an email saying her mother was diagnosed with ALS and went steeply downhill over the last month, like from downhill. She's totally can't even scratch her back anymore. Like can't even, she can move two fingers on one hand. So it went really fast for her. So it can go really fast. And I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen ALS in like, years and years and now it's two people in a very like very short period of time I was told about so um so yeah it's um it's not a, f a fun path to be on it's really a difficult time and uh so the most support that you can give the you know the better the more appreciative they'll be so yeah and you have the tools so you really do have the tools and if you guys want to powwow about it as you're working with him, I'm happy to talk about it and, and, and see what I can help with or even zoom in a session or something if you're having difficulty. So yeah, I'm happy to do Okay. That. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions around, around those the neurological issues? No. <laughs> there's there's I was, a picture. I was, think, I was thinking of dementia and how that um, okay. compares. Yeah, so there is a component of dementia that can occur with ALS um, and also with MS. So sometimes there is a component of dementia that can creep in as well. It's not, uh, I think it's less common than. It's not the usual path, but it can happen. They don't know exactly why, what the cause of it is either. Um, so you want to be alert to the signs of dementia, but typically that's not the course. So hopefully that won't be the course for, for him. Um, yeah, but if you do see signs of dementia, it's good to point them out um, or maybe talk to family about it. But I am hoping that that's not the case yeah. at least. Yeah. More common with like um, what Tiziano's mother had, which is cortical basal degeneration, where the actual brain is actual brain damage, brain degeneration, then dementia sets in more commonly. Mm. Yeah, and MS dementia is really not not a usual either. So yeah. Yeah. I know, such a nice, <laughs> lively topic. 
unfortunately. But just know yeah. that you, you actually can do, you can be so helpful and so critical. Yeah. I mean, for, for life daily function, and that's what you want to think about is, can they get up and down from a chair? Because if they can get up and down from a chair, it makes them a lot more mobile. Can they get up and down off the floor? All these things that make you be able to get function. How, how far can you walk? Can you walk around this place? Does he have to do stairs to get in and out? Can you do the stairs to get in and out? Uh, can he, is he strong enough to lift up uh, books or is he strong enough to feed himself, coordinate enough to feed himself? So any of these motions that seem to be functional are the ones that you want to keep doing and keep reinforcing. So hopefully there's some pathway that even if the nerves are degenerating, those pathways stay open or the body finds another pathway. And interesting, a little bit of a side sidebar, but also really interesting, I think, is um, there is a model for, we use it a lot with people who have had a stroke, right? Which is more brain damage, but it still talks about pathway to mus muscles to create movement. And it's called NDT. And basically what they do is they, for people who have had strokes, they usually, if somebody's had a severe stroke, half of their, their hemiplegic, half of their body, they can't use. So the side of the brain, opposite sides, if the right side of the brain was affected by the stroke, the left side, they can't move their left arm, they can't move their left leg properly. Maybe they get some function, but not a lot. And they end up a lot of times in this contraction, uh, flexion contraction kind of posturing. And so this NDT model says that if you require the movement, then the brain will find a way. And so and cruel, quite cruelly, NDT mitts, they put mitts on the working side, mitt on the hand and the arm on that working side. So they're forcing the use of the non-working side or the side that was affected by the stroke. And they had amazing results with people regaining function. So as if there's a lot of times there's inflammation and bleeding in the brain after a stroke. And so sometimes when that clears, then that's when they see how much permanent damage there is. But by wrapping up and not allowing use of the side that was not affected, people actually regained more function on their, the side that was affected by the stroke than people who did not have that. Uh, functioning side uh, stopped from moving. So if, in other words, with, with the demand on the side that wasn't working, they found the pathway to that side to get work out of that side. So you want to challenge these people a bit, not so that they get frustrated, but enough that they're working the side that doesn't want to work, not ignoring the side that doesn't work. Ignoring, ignoring things that don't work and just not using them is not a great mode, uh, not in the clinic. But what you want to do is help the person be functional outside the clinic. So in, if you're working with somebody who has one arm that's not working and the other one that is working in the studio, you, can, you have tools to help them make that non-working side work and you want to make it work. But you might think about, okay, so it's really hard to get going in the morning. He needs to get ready for work and get out of the house and he needs to brush his teeth and brush his hair. I need to figure out, I need to keep that other side or find compensatory patterns to get through the other functional activities. So what can I do to help that person find another way to get, to get from point A to point B or to get this job done at this point in their day when they don't have time to slow down and think and challenge the side that they're having a hard time. So finding compensatory patterns and helping them find a way is also a really great tool that you can use. So another example would be if walking up the stairs, right? In the studio, you wanna make sure they're walking up the stairs the way everybody does and the way they always have. But at home, if they have to get up and down the stairs and they're having difficulty and there's no one there to spot them, you want to teach them how to do it, walking up sideways, holding onto the railing, or however it is that they can actually do it on their own. You want them to have that compensatory pattern for independence. But when we're in the studio, we want to work on getting them strong enough to do it the way they always have, or keeping them as strong as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah. So finding ways, because it's a progressive thing, that eventually they're going to need 
some tools and some compensatory patterns and maybe a cane or maybe, you know, those tools they're going to need later on. So, but we want to keep them as strong as possible when we're working with them and make them work the hard, do the hard things while they're with us. Yeah. So. Yes, on that note, <laughs> any other questions, topics, anything? What's your theme? What's my theme? My theme next week, uh, <laughs> I forgot what my theme is for next week. Hold on, give me one second. Oh, what, was your you. theme? what was your theme this week? Because I didn't make it last week. week. Yeah. Well, last week was the stretch and the strength, which I think we right. talked about. This right. week is I'm back at just the right amount of muscle contraction. Okay. Just the right okay. amount of work. So going back through a lot of the exercises, going on to how much work you want to do and recruiting it when it's supposed to be recruited, but not recruiting it when it's not supposed to be recruiting, not recruiting the wrong muscles and not working harder than you have to to get the, the work done that you have to get done. So that was this week. And next week, I will tell you in just a second, I'm gonna disappear for a moment and I will tell you. Okay, so next week's theme is hold on to your head. <laughs> so I um, am coming back around to the neck. Yep, hold on to your head. I am so tired of this. <laughs> And I don't seem to be getting that across that we don't want to pull on the head to come up into upper ab curl. And why by now can our clients not do an upper ab curl without their hands behind their neck, the healthy necks that we have? They should be able to do that now. So um, I'm going back to hand positioning for head posturing, head, head neck posturing through exercise and head neck posturing in um, life. So hold on to your head, meaning, <laughs> You hold on to it, get it there, and then keep it there. Hold your head in the right place because that will really help the neck a lot. So that that is the goal and the theme for next week. If you guys want to jump on board that, I'm sure you have plenty in that category. Yeah. Well, in my bone strengthening class, I don't know. I don't do a lot oh. of upper ab curl. Yes, but you know what I've but. been doing a lot of? is head floats. Yeah. Did I have I shown you, I've shown you the head float, right? Where? Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. And I, yeah. I've been doing it with like one of my clients that has osteopenia, the mm -hmm. head float. Yes. No, I've been doing I don't know of, that one, Zaina. Can you d describe it or show yeah. me? Um, the head float is really um, just that, but it activates, I think a little bit better than muscles. Yeah. Um, and gets a little bit of work out of them in a really nice head posture without loading the spine uh, because we're not rolling on the spine. So it takes a lot of support from the hands. So hold on to the head, interlace those fingers, really grab hold. And I usually have them start without any movement. So taking a breath in and then exhaling, finding the rib cage downward of it, and then inhale, right, exhaling and really working. My cueing lately has been the lowest ribs down in towards the back body. So taking the lowest ribs in towards the back body and then releasing. And then the whole time the hands are here while that's happening and just giving some length to the back of the neck so that when those low ribs go down, my head floats just a bit. So the ribs are pulling down and the back of my neck is stretching and my head floats right here. And that's it and then release, right? So it's just a head float. So I'm not rounding my thoracic spine, so I don't feel like I'm loading it. I'm just taking the head ever so slightly off and I'm using my hands to pull long through the back of the neck so that I get that float and then down. And then they can actually feel that connection a little bit better to the rib cage than they can if the head stays all the way down, yeah? So that is my head float that I've well, been using I, a lot. I've, I've been um, telling them to look up, up, maybe at the top <laughs> corner, maybe of the room, across the room, rather than lifting up. Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, it's more just lengthening. I've been doing it prone as well, right? Mm. So the prone version of it is the nose just floating over the mat, right? So here, and just being able to have the hands pull the body a little bit long, the back of the neck long, and my nose just floating. It can be lower, but here I feel like I've got connection through. And so I can head float this way too, and down and head floats. This is really great strengthening and lengthening for the back of the neck. Really great stability exercise for the neck here too. And just being able to stay here, you could do arm movements all through that range, right? That, that would also um, challenge that. So head float back and head float front for the people who cannot lift, but for everybody, it's good. But all, especially for those who can't upper ab curl, I think getting them into head float, I call it. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think I'll focus a lot on that, a lot of the head posturing and really try and get them more and more aware of this center uh, body. I prep that a little bit in today's class with having them do a lot of work in neutral, but feeling what's happening in holding spine neutral on all fours and feeling how much work they can do here to lighten the arms and lighten the legs by using their abs, but not even moving out of neutral while they're doing it. So um, I hope they got that idea. But that way, um, that also helps connect this to this, which is really key, the, those ribs to this is a really big key to the success of posture, really. So, so yeah, that is where I'm going next week. And then if you guys have any themes, send them my way. I have to come up with a whole bunch more. I'm out of topics. So it's a great time if you have any ideas or things that seem challenging to you. If you send them my way, I'll put them on the little list and we'll go through them. And that way we can work through the challenging things and maybe even you'll benefit from your own classes, right? <laughs> so that's always nice when that happens. All right. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. And then if you guys have questions on any of that, let me know. Sorry I wasn't more prepared, but I just wanted a little scattered, but it's some information going your way anyway. If, yeah, um, no, it's but helpful. It was helpful. Yeah. 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 You might not so, think it was helpful, but it was, yeah, it was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good. And if you have other ideas and topics and things that come up, I'm so happy to discuss them with you um, and help help you guys understand them better. So okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good to see you all and talk to you. So yes. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon.